Hello everyone, my name is Isabel Dennis and I'm the Fair Director for Collect. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Collect 2021, the International Art Fair for Contemporary Craft and Design. Launched in 2004 by the Crafts Council, Collect is the leading art fair for contemporary craft and has been instrumental in developing and growing the collecting market. Maintaining the open-hearted nature of the fair and at a time when we can't come together in the fair's home at Somerset House, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the online version of Collect for 2021. This year we have 32 carefully selected gallerists from all over the world representing almost 400 artists and representing around 35 nations. The exceptional works for sale at Collect can be viewed on the online art platform artsy.net and the link will be displayed at the end so you can go and visit and enjoy. The works will continue to be for sale right up until the 24th of March. So today I'm delighted to be introducing a talk that I'm really looking forward to with the features editor of House and Garden, Elizabeth Metcalf. Presented by House and Garden magazine, what role does contemporary craft play in the, in the home? Today Elizabeth is joined by talented interior designer Joe Leglud from Maddox Creative, London-based ga um, gallerist and collect gallerist Juliana Cavaliero from Cavaliero Finn, and Paris-based gallerist Laurence Bonnel from Gallery saint um, and they will be in and they will be in discussion about about the importance of contemporary craft and how it can enrich the where we live, the interiors that we live in. Um, I'll let Elizabeth introduce the other guests, but Elizabeth Metcalf is the features editor of House and Garden magazine, and having studied English literature at King's College. She then went on to gain a master's degree in history of art from the Courtauld Institute of Art. She's then been with the magazine for over five years and she regularly writes about craft and she lives in London. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so do feel free to add in questions and we will get to those at the end and try and answer as many as we can. Um, and so over to Elizabeth, enjoy. Thank you ever so um, much, Isabel, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Isabel said, my name is Elizabeth Metcalf and I'm the Deputy Features Editor at House and Garden. This afternoon, we're going to be discussing the role that craft plays in our homes. Um, the Craft Council's The Market for Craft report revealed that in 2020, 73% of the population bought a piece of craft with more younger people investing in pieces um, and seeing it as a potential to enhance the interior design of their homes. The events of the past year have not only intensified our interest in our homes, but also placed an emphasis on slowness and appreciation of the smaller things and traditional processes and sort of labor intensive techniques, all of what really constitutes craft. Today, we'll be discussing what craft can add to an interior and how to take a piece from the context of a gallery to a domestic space. Um, we'll also explore the various different materials that constitute craft. Um, I just want to reiterate what Isabel said about questions. Please do send them in throughout the talk as we will have some time at the end for questions. It's just the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So I'm delighted to be joined today by three experts who each have different, but in many ways, converging um, perspectives on how craft can be incorporated into our homes. Um, you may have been expecting Sophie Ashby as one of our speakers, but unfortunately she can't join us this afternoon. Um, so instead, I am delighted to be joined by Jo Leglud of interior design practice Maddox Creative which she co-founded in 2011, along with Scott Maddox. The practice is known for its idiosyncratic style characterized by bold and playful interiors. Jo describes Scott as the creative lead while she is the details person. Um, and actually Jo's background is also in craft. Before setting up Maddox Creative, she specialized in embroidery and couture beadwork, working in the fashion industry for many years. Also joining us, we have Collect Gallerist Juliana Cavallero, 
um, of London-based gallery Cavallero Finn, which she co-founded in 2004. It champions quality original heirloom craft, everything from colourful sculptural, colourful metal sculptural forms to slip cast ceramic vessels. Our third panellist, also a collect gallerist, is Laurence Bonnel from Paris-based gallery Seine Ouverte, which she set up in 2016. Laurence specialises in pieces by young and well-known artists and craftspeople, with a focus on furniture and lighting, as well as the smaller pieces. So to start off, um, I'd love to ask kind of the glaring question here, Joe, but what is it for you that a piece of craft brings to an interior? Obviously, you're as an interior designer, you are thinking about um, the whole space, right from, you know, the architecture down to the tiniest sort of vase on a table. But what is it that craft can bring to a space um, that can bring, you know, can bring to a room? I think it's um, very much a, a, there's a sort of a dialogue within the piece itself. When you're working with uh, the image, um, for example, that we're looking at here, which is a grade two listed building, it has some of its own character, obviously. You have to allow that to really shine. And it's about kind of layering up pieces that kind of can um, enhance that or sort of play off the, highlight some of the, the architectural detailing and, and kind of, uh, make a room that feels cohesive, but also has some kind of interaction between the pieces. And I think where you have some pieces that may be vintage or antique, then also a piece of craft work also has its own intrinsic story to tell. Mm. And I think it's that sort of meditation on one area of craft from each maker that can kind of add layers that um, is, is sort of immediately not necessarily perceptible, but actually when you spend time in a space and you grow comfortable with a piece then you really appreciate it over a longer period of time. Exactly and, and with this, so, sorry just going back to the, the previous slide, um, so in that space this is an image that we featured in the magazine um, mm. a couple of years ago I think now and um, there's the wonderful vessels on the sideboard and then there's that amazing stool um, and yes. you know, and the incredible um, chandelier above. Do you want to just sort of say about how those pieces yeah. were were chosen? Sure. Um, so I mean, it, it's actually quite subtle, but there is actually like a handmade wallpaper on the walls mm. there, which is actually obviously quite um, neutral, but actually it starts to kind of add this sort of layering that I'm describing. <clears throat> and the Pierre Wistenberg, I think, um, yeah. are the vessels piece there and the Anton Alvarez stool. So the client very much wanted a fresh interior, but for it to feel colorful and homely and kind of of interest. So, mm -hmm. you know, we commissioned various pieces in, in the space, but she was a collector and she had this Matt Collish or she had the Anton Alvarez wrap stools, which I think are beautiful. Um, and then the next image, if we just move on to that one, um, these incredible, I think they're Kate yeah. Malone ceramics they on are, the yeah. antique cabinet, which obviously it, it really proves how craft can can work with everything else. You know, it's sort of it's just layering the space up. Absolutely. And similarly, even though this is a different project, we've sort of got quite a lovely neutral, but also considered backdrop for these pieces. So we've got this sort of parquet de Versailles, beautiful neutral Knox back floor and this handmade parchment um, mural. The client had these beautiful antiques and then the Kate Malone pieces just kind of, you know, reference the beautiful turned pieces on the furniture that, you know, that that sort of layering and it, the fact that it's contemporary, I, I find that really exciting and really find that the, the textures and colours are all sort of playing off each other as well as the forms there, I think it's absolutely mm. and and i mean you sort of touched on this because obviously the projects that you're you're doing are revealing the personality of the person whose home you're decorating or and and, yeah. and designing but juliana i i know before this talk we spoke about um kind of how craft can really reveal something about someone's personality and i wondered if you could just say a bit more about that and the way in which in which you think craft can add depth to someone's home Yes, yeah, so I think it's always really interesting when I go into people's houses with their ceramic collections or what their 
personal collections that there's a they're very much creating their own unique collection. So they're bringing these beautiful pieces that they've selected into their homes and they're creating this beautiful dialogue with their own home. And I think it's quite a, a, an emotional, personal reaction to an object that makes people, um, draws people to an object. So how does it make you feel? Um, does it bring you joy? Sometimes pieces can be challenging, but they can stay with you. Uh, you you know, I often will see a piece and then I can't stop thinking about it. And then as you learn more about the piece, you know, it, it kind of adds to that feeling of wanting to kind of cover to own it and treasure it really. And I, I think people spend a lot of time and money on their houses, you know, they might spend a lot on their kitchen, but actually bringing in craft does reveal a bit about your personality and you are expressing yourself through the work that you have on show. Absolutely. And the wonderful thing about a piece of craft, I mean, unless it's sort of a fitted, you know, bespoke piece of craft that's specifically designed for a space is that, you know, you can take it with you, unlike a kitchen, which, <laughs> which exactly. when you move, it's stuck there, but actually a beautiful um, tapestry or a beautiful vase can, can go with you. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're companions really. So, once you have your piece, so you get very attached to it, and, it mm. and they're companions in life. So like you say, you can move house and it can travel with you wherever you go. And it's also kind of safe and secure and it's your landscape. Mm. So uh, I love that feeling that it was someone else's story then comes into your life and becomes your story that stays with you and passes through generation to generation. And that's uh, kind of one of the beautiful things about collecting. Absolutely. Um, and as we've seen with the, the images from um, Joe's projects, um, and I think we're really keen to get across in this, that craft isn't just the, the kind of the smaller pieces or, you know, the vases that might sit on a piece of furniture. It's also the furniture itself. And, um, you know, a piece of furniture can be and, and is just as crafted as, um, as a vase or a ceramic piece or a, a piece of a turned wood. And um, Laurence, I know that that's something that you really focus on through Saint Nouvelle. You're, you're really interested in, in kind of larger pieces. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about the kinds of things that you're drawn to and the kinds of pieces that, um, that you, you sort of show as a gallery. Yes, um, for me, uh, you know, craft is really about uh, the opposite of industry. And of course, uh, it's all handmade. So mm. um, when I work with the artists, uh, usually they propose most uh, at the beginning, small pieces. And I really like to push them in their, uh, in their confidence zone, out of their confidence zone to create bigger pieces. Uh, I think now the biggest one we have is a uh, is, uh, shell books from uh, William Coggin in ceramics, but all of them, Celia Bertrand, as you can see, uh, created for her last show some uh, chairs. Um, and they, they, when I, I ask them to go uh, to make big things like that, uh, they really get to search the difficult things. Uh, for example, there, uh, Celia made the chairs with the, the seat is in porcelain. And uh, the piece, the round piece is on the side of porcelain and on the other side, she asks to, uh, to uh, embroidery uh, to be made by in a feather by Clementine Brandibas. Uh, and so this kind of wave of uh, feather is answering to the porcelain. And wow. it's really a beautiful piece, very unique. Absolutely. And so many different elements pulling it all together. I mean, exactly. they, sort of, they sort of look so delicate and yet... Exactly. There's a real strength to them. <laughs> and I think what is really important in this is that uh, each piece is really unique. You mm -hmm. never, even if you want to make a small edition as it's made by hand, there is always a little difference. So I like very much this kind of, uh, of work. And then on the, if we go to the next slide, um, we've got these amazing um, sort of side tables stools you know kind of multi-purpose in a way by Abel Carsimo um, and there's this one in marble and then um, we've got another one coming up that's in bronze but is that's presumably a similar uh, you know it's a sort of similar thing to the chairs they're kind of playing with materials and our perceptions of what a material can do. Um, exactly uh, Abel uh, began to work in plaster 
he really uh, works like a sculptor. He makes a, first a drawing, then he makes the piece in plaster. And after we decided together to make one piece in bronze and one piece in marble so they can talk to each other maybe, but they express very different things with these materials. And that's really interesting to see how it can work differently. And uh, when you see this piece, it's a little table or it's a stool or it's a sculpture. It's really, it's a really, the whatever free, you yeah, yeah you're free to kind of interpret it as you wish uh, and then on to the next image we've got these incredible ceramic um sort of stools tables i mean stools or tables or again both <laughs> um which i i spoke joe we was, we spoke about this when we were looking at the images and and the idea that they they look so lovely as a little quartet in the different colors and and you could kind of almost visualize them in a in an interior Absolutely, I think they're really beautiful, really very cool pieces, and and actually shown there as as if there were sort of tumbling pebbles sort of falling away from you, which you could totally do in you know in one of the rooms we just looked at, the sort of scattering of tables. It's really beautiful, absolutely really, really special. And Laurence, is that is is Reno Clessons a, a new um, craftsperson that you're working with, or? Yes, it's the first time we show his work. Uh, he's really young. He just uh, get out of the school of mm. Endoven. Uh, and I think he has uh, already a lot of um, how in, uh, he, he's really, he knows where he wants to go. That's really important. Mm. And uh, he likes to make very big things. So uh, it's going to be a very nice collaboration, I think. Well, that's exciting for you as well, that he's already committed to the big things. So, yeah. you, um, <laughs> so I mean, I kind of want to, to ask you all a bit more specifically about the, the types of pieces, types of craft that you're drawn to. Joe, obviously, in the context of interior design, you're thinking about the visual impact that a piece can have on a room. Is there any, are there any particular things that you're all, you're always excited by and drawn to any particular materials or? I, well, I'm always excited by textiles, obviously. Um, <laughs> that's, that's absolutely my thing. But, but actually, I, I think as I've kind of um, worked for a very long time in textiles, I've actually, I've had to go at lots of different crafts and the kind of myself. So I kind of um, understand some more of the complexities of um, ceramics now, which I didn't in my, when I was mm. working as an embroiderer, but, um, and I think that um, once you've had a go at making something, you can kind of appreciate it on a slightly deeper level, I think. And I think, um, and I, I sort of set that as my mission. I do really love trying things and just experimenting with different materials. But um, I think it is about, um, that I suppose, allowing a specific piece to have a breath also in that it might, it might be sort of, juxtaposed against interesting things in a particular interior but also that it has a moment to shine on its own almost like you can allow your eyes to settle on it and it has its sort of own moment of glory I think that feels like it's worth you know positioning things or kind of um, choosing things that resonate with you so that you can do that you allow your eyes to rest on it yeah um, yeah and um Juliana are you thinking when you're um sort of looking at pieces for the gallery and, and the kinds of you know cross people that you're going to represent are you drawn to the kind of narrative of a piece or is it really instinctual are you is it sort of color uh, or texture I, or? I think it's a combination of everything so mm. it's the technical brilliance and the skills mm. involved mm. the beauty the uh, the colors the form but the narrative is really important to us because I think that's the the, the under it underpins the work and it becomes their story so whether it's the River Deven in Annie Turner's work or the Cumbrian landscape in the tapestries behind mm. me here, um, uh, there's a line of, of a story that runs through the work and makes it so distinctive to the artist and makes their pieces so unique to them. And then actually they become recognisable through that yeah, story. Definitely. And actually, if we if we bring the next slide up, um, these incredible ceramics that, yeah. that sort of completely play with you, you sort of look at them and can't quite work out what the material is but it, I think that's probably something you've experienced with this work. Yes so um, Björk Karelsdottir is an Icelandic artist based in um, Somerset and she was an architect and she makes these pieces she plans them like an architect so she uses sketches and 
she's very influenced by this, the Nordic patterns of her roots, really, her Icelandic roots, and they almost have a kind of textile feel, but they're ceramic. And, you, and um, they've got this beautiful <laughs> form where this monochrome minimalism and this beautiful form and, and also this rawness to the work, mm. this handmade quality. Um, and they just, uh, when you turn them around, some of the forms are kind of uh, ebb and flow and they have a lovely sort of handcrafted feel and yet they're visually so impactful. Yeah, because I think one of the, um, one of the things that that we were sort of thinking about is obviously these are kind of monochrome but um Laurence I know we we were talking about how colour is actually playing a bit more of a role in craft um I mean obviously looking at Juliana's backdrop at the moment with the wonderful tapestries it seems like colour's always been there but um are you finding that people are, are kind of more being, are being a little bit braver in their choices and more keen to embrace colour? Yes, uh, we made a, a show in the beginning of uh, in September with uh, Lea Mest, which is mm. very pop, very a uh, lot of color. And I thought that it would be difficult because uh, so mm. much colors and uh, it had been, uh, everything had been sold. So uh, wow. no, people really like color now. I think it's maybe with the time we are living, it's yeah. a little bit uh, the reason they want uh, something pop, something uh, maybe like a, a cartoon, you know, something uh, funny. Yeah, it's joyful. Joyful, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, joyful. It makes you smile. Yeah. Um, and actually, back at those wonderful ceramic pieces that we were we were just looking at from uh, Cavallero Finn, um, I think ceramics are one of the materials that are that are slightly more accessible, especially if you're thinking about starting a collection. They seem um, a little bit less daunting than other things. Is, is that something you find, Juliana? Do you, I mean, obviously, when you set up Cavallero Finn, one of your main focuses was and is ceramics. And is that something you find that people kind of feel a bit more comfortable with? I think there is a, a big popularity in ceramic collection, and I suppose. I think we're all looking at materiality and how material is produced. And so we're always looking at not just ceramics, but ceramics seems to be very popular and people mm. understand it. Um, and I suppose it's that sort of going back to clay and the earth um, and the process. But yeah, I, we have a lot of ceramic makers, but now we're also investigating um, different media. So we have textiles, um, metal, but again, it's many, it's how, people use their material to create something totally unique and contemporary really that we're interested in. Yeah and actually on textiles um, I know that this is something that you and Jo are, are particularly, um, well Jo's already expressed her allegiance to textiles mm -hmm. and, and tapestries but I know that's something that both of you are interested in and behind Juliana at the moment are these wonderful tapestries um, that um, as you said earlier depict, did you say it depicts the landscape? Um, Catherine Swells is the artist and she grew up in Cumbria so she's very so there is landscape references mm. but there's also an abstract minimalism to the work too um, and you, as sorry do you find that um is it a sort of new interest in in tapestries and warlock is there anything that's that sort of put people off at any point or is it you know do you think it is kind of well, a new I think, interest I mean obviously it's one of the oldest mm. traditions I mean Annie Arbus said in 65 that um, threads are one of the earliest transmitters of meaning mm. and so they go back thousands of years and uh, there is definitely a resurgence in interest um, and I think again it's like going back to the slow process this feeling of things taking the time to make something very slowly sitting at the loom weaving the threads and there's so many painters are, are turning to tapestry to recreate their own paintings and so there is this interest in sort of using the threads like paint almost to weave in colours and create this beautiful, um, very moving um, installation really. I mean, the first time I saw Catherine's work, I was extremely moved. It was almost like looking at an Annie Albus. There's a beautiful reduction and minimalism, but when you look closely, she actually hand dyes each of her worst, each of the threads. She wow. hand dyes the wool and then she, so each colour is, made by hand and then she weaves so you have this beautiful subtle um minimalist very calm meditative um installation 
and you can see the landscape coming through in these pieces. Um, they they are incredibly calming. Just the colours are so sort of soothing. And um, do you find that on a on a kind of very practical note, that is tapestry scary because or you know I, kind of weaving? How yeah. do you clean it? Or is... people worry about tapestry, but you know you don't think about dusting your curtains. But <laughs> I think you just treat tapestry the way you treat any artwork. So you wouldn't put a work on paper in the sunlight. So you wouldn't put a tapestry in the basement, but they're pretty, they're durable. I mean, they've been around for centuries. And I think we can, there are so many ways to show them. I mean, if people are really worried, they can use amazing glass now, non-reflective glass, anti-fade. There are so many ways to present works like this. Um, you know, if you are fearful of exposing them, but I love the fact that you can see this texture and this three dimensionality to the work. Um, that's what makes them so special, I think. And actually, um, they're incredible if you're limited for sort of shelf space or, or sort of surface space because they can go on the walls and yeah. everybody will have walls. So <laughs> that is a kind of exciting way to display something if you if you don't have lots of, of surfaces yeah, and to put things on. There's a lot of craft is going on walls now. There's a lot of wall work mm, you can have. Yeah. Um, and it's a, like you say, it's a different way of showing craft. Um, and they're very painterly, but then they're not painting. So there's that beautiful dialogue between, you know, the object and using the threads like paint, as you say. And it's going back to what we've been saying about materiality and that kind of like making you slightly question what it is or questioning your view of a material or how a material should be used. Because it, it is that thing you sort of looking at them on the screen now behind you. I'm thinking, is it a paint? You know, I know it's a tapestry, yeah. but it does have that wonderful painterly yes. um, quality. And, and it's a shame that you know, in now we can't show people this texture. Um, and that's one of the downfalls of being locked down. But um, we're very fortunate to be in this space in Marylebone and Sashira and actually have this exhibition on. Yeah. Um, and I wish I could show you, I mean, see in the video, but I wish I could show you that beautiful intensity of the threads. It's yeah. Exquisite. And I think if you own this piece, just coming home to this every day, I mean, away from the frenetic kind of frenzied life, it's always going to be a kind of very comforting space. Yeah. Um, another um, piece of wall art that um, that Joe and I had a look at was, and, and was also on show um, through 50 Goldborn at Collect, um, is this wonderful um, piece by Sana Gatea, um, which is made from um, hundreds of paper beads that are stitched on one by one to bark cloth. Uh, and the beads um, are made from reclaimed paper from newspapers, magazines, books, um, and then they're kind of applied one by one. And Joe, I know that you love this piece. And do you want to just say a bit about why it's it's so exciting and, and how you'd potentially use it in a space? Well, I, I hadn't, I didn't know um, this artist's work at all until Collect last year. And, and I was so blown away by, I suppose it, it would appeal to my sensibilities really, but because it does, it is a, I, I would consider it a textile, um, even though it's paper and textile, but um, I just, I find the level of detail that you get from having, and I've also had a go at this, so <laughs> I don't know, um, like rolling up the paper and making little beads and then using them. Um, and I think it's, it's a beautiful piece. It was really stunning. And I think the scale is really interesting. And I think, you know, tapestries used to be, you know, hung on walls and, you know, in big old houses and they act as kind of, you know, to help a space feel more comfortable or more cozy and they also kind of um help to deaden the sound a little bit they're a little bit acoustic they help the acoustics of a room also so i think i mean i just find them stunning um and you know a great thing to have i mean it's beautiful yeah and just on the screen now is is another piece um mm. that's that's on, currently on show in the craft council's um gallery space but i mean just so intricate and yeah. in a similar way to the threads in in Catherine Swells's work it's that kind of all of those colors and the way in which it kind of weaves together to create and I think and I love the fact that that the paper here is um taken from books or newspapers so there actually is a narrative there is actually yeah. words on the you know kind of bound into it it's um they're really really amazing yeah it's beautiful um, so we've sort of talked about the materials that we love and that are that are kind of, you know, easy to easy to sort of not easy, but, you know, a little bit more accessible. But I, I also want to kind of talk about materials that might might seem a little difficult or a little intimidating. And one one thing that I think 
can be difficult is glass um, and not not by the example we're about to show you because I think and this is an incredible piece but um, Laurence this is a piece that you're currently showing um, by Martin Vruelich and um, that picture doesn't quite illustrate it but the piece is huge um, and I just wondered if you could say a little bit about kind of glass and why it can be difficult and why for you this piece sort of goes beyond and, and, and you know is incredible. Yes, of course. Usually, we I think we, we imagine uh, glass pieces mm -hmm. are very thin, very fragile. And uh, usually, I'm not so interested by glass, but uh, Martin uh, makes uh, his pieces are very, very big. They are uh, huge. And uh, it's more like uh, the work, like the same, it's more a sculptural work. Um, and there is something about g -well also, because all these colors and the, the, the inclusion of, of glass inside the blown glass is very impressive. And uh, it's very heavy also. So when you put it somewhere, uh, you're sure that uh, your cat won't uh, make it follow. <laughs> <laughs> make it fail. Sorry. No, no, you're right. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but uh, you can see here on the. I, I, I'm not sure we can imagine. Yes, now we can imagine. It's quite. A, this yeah. one is a big piece, and there is a even bigger. Uh, and uh, so they are not not fragile, and these kind of pieces are really um, uh, easy to live with. Uh, the only thing is to find a, a place to install them. Oh, look at that! Amazing. Yeah, they're wonderful. Joe, is glass a material that, that, I mean, obviously I'm sure it finds form somewhere in your projects, but is glass something that you, do you have that similar sort of fear about it being fragile or is it something that you, you've kind of got beyond? <laughs> um, I suppose um, in terms of glass objects, mm. I, 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 there are some makers that I do love, um, but um, they are, um, Chris Day particularly, I've mm. just, picked up on whose work I really love, who has a lovely expression, but I love this piece as well. Um, I think in terms of things like mirrors and in terms of like stained glass windows, mm. I can be completely mesmerized by them. So I'm kind of, there are a few pieces that I love, but I'm, yeah, less so than ceramics to be. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, and a question that um, I, I'd love to also ask you, Joe, is obviously with lots of the pieces that people see in galleries or in fairs um they can be kind of elevated on a white plinth or they can feel very removed from the interior the home that they're going to the domestic environment they're going to and how do you sort of how do you kind of get over that how do you sort of think okay that piece because it's also seeing everything on mass in a kind of gallery context it's quite hard to think about how that one item can work on its own in a space how do you you know, how is it that an environment changes the space? Sorry, how is it that a piece changes, you know, how is it that the environment changes um, the, the piece? Um, I suppose um, we, when we kind of looking at considering a piece for a client for a project, we would normally be, normally be quite late on in the project, not 100% mm -hmm. of the time, but, mm -hmm. but we've had a period to get to know the clients and we know what they love and what they don't love and how the rooms come together, where there might be an opportunity for a piece. And I think that's often um, just a matter of, uh, you know, we, at Collect last year, we came across some pieces that were just perfect, a group of three vases um, that worked perfectly for quite a sort of unusual project that we've been working on for several years. And it just, they happened to be the right piece at the right mm. time. Um, and then very kindly, which really helps everybody in this conversation the gallery allowed us to borrow the pieces so that we could install them in the client's house and they had a moment to well, I think over a weekend to mm -hmm. just sort of get used to them to see with, whether they were kind of completely happy and and yeah we did buy them so that does work um and then I think you know it's about um kind of lighting actually what I was saying earlier a little bit of lighting but yeah. they don't need all to be kind of, you know, big and bold all the time, all the sense of the focus of the room, but just to kind of um, have a moment to um, to be enjoyed. Totally. And do, yeah. so, I mean, I, I think it's obviously so dependent on the piece, but in terms of whether you're going to light it specifically, because I know with art, people get very, there's a lot of conversations about what, how a piece of art should be lit. And do you find that something 
it, obviously it depends on the size of the piece and the material but is that something that you're you're having to think about within the lighting scheme about you know whether a light might illuminate a certain you know a beautiful vase or something yeah I think I, yes absolutely and I think um it might not necessarily um be evident at the start of the project that that's where a piece needs to be so, mm. it, so there is always that consideration but um I think uh yeah some some things require I suppose it also it depends on the room so if you're going to be in a dining room and and you're going to be mostly there in the evening and that's the time when you want to enjoy the piece then then obviously the piece needs to be lit yeah um but but I think it, it's um so a really kind of uh, handholdy process with the client to help you know everything kind of settle in and be appreciated absolutely is, yeah and um Laurence and Juliana I know that both of you as gallerists are very committed to showing pieces not in a sort of white cube environment but in a much more um kind of accessible layered space that feels more reflective of of a domestic space um and actually if we could just bring the next slide up um which is um, a wonderful exhibition that uh, Juliana put on in a chapel, which obviously isn't a domestic space, but it's it's kind of showing you the different colours and different materials that these pieces can, can and how the craft works alongside those. Juliana, do you want to just say a little bit about um, kind of why you why you all kind of anti the white cube approach well, and, and, and what you yeah. think that gives people? Yeah, well, we started our gallery 17 years ago now, so we're as old as collect. But um, and we wanted to take the work out of the white cube and make it a little bit more, um, less intimidating, really, and, and invite people to see how the work would look in their own home. So we've shown in my home for 17 years now, um, and we hang out with paintings and ceramics, and there's always a lovely dialogue. And this is an exhibition we did in Fitzrovia Chapel. And it was a ceramic show. It was called Altar, playing on this um, altar and altering the clay. But what we realized when we brought the pieces in, that the marble of the wall just interacted so exquisitely with the pieces on show. So there was, again, this stunning dialogue between the works. And as the light went down in the night and we lit it, it, was, it just had such a beautiful, almost kind of very spiritual feeling actually to the work and you get to see the the works change in the different lighting and I just love that surprise that you get when you take place pieces and put them in different environments there's always a lovely surprise just as in Kettle's Yard you have you know a Brancusi on the piano or you'll have a Barbara Hepworth in the bedroom or a Wallace in the toilet you know there's always that lovely interesting there's always spaces to put art, I think, and craft. And I think there's, within our houses, in the most surprising areas and places, there's a, there's a spot that you can find. And actually Kettle's Yard is such a wonderful demonstration of, of that kind of non-hierarchical approach, which, exactly. you know, sort of not elevating anything and, and, and sort of things are playful and fun. And it's a sort of exciting way to show yeah. things without feeling too precious. Yes, exactly. And in this show, Crafting Difference, we're doing for Collect, mm. um, you can see we're in a more domestic mm. space. So we've got this beautiful cabinet that's been made by Sashira, and that goes with the works on top. And so again, it's it's less austere and it's more domestic. So you can imagine the pieces would look just like this if you brought them home. Do you, um, and actually, in the context of um, the, the chapel pitch we just looked at and also now your background, do you feel that the artists and, and craftspeople, are they, do they have a kind of set vision about how they hope the work might be displayed? And is that something you have to sort of obviously consider in your process of, of displaying works? Is that something that yeah. comes, comes in? I think most artists would, would have a, give us mm. kind of instructions of how they should be shown. Um, yeah. But obviously you can't control that when it leaves. Yeah. <laughs> you know I've, I've been into houses where they've hung things quite differently yeah but, but I suppose that's up to the owner you know they're interpreting it how they want but we try to stick to the kind of aesthetic of the artist because they created it and put it together absolutely and they've often they often have spent a long time like with Catherine's tapestries you know there's a beautiful relationship between the colors here mm. and that's really important to the piece and I love the way it's just straight at the top beautiful so it's kind of got that modernness very, very clean hang. Um, and we've followed her instructions on that. So, yeah. yeah. 
Nice. And Laurence, do you want to just say a little bit about, I know that obviously you, you try and kind of show things again in a, in a more domestic context. Why do you find that's important? Does it, does it kind of make people be able to visualise how a piece could then work in their homes? Or is it just always been something you've, you've done since you, since you launched the gallery? Oh, um, I, five years ago, uh, I opened in the, the flea market in Paris. So um, in the flea market, you have to, to construct, uh, no, you don't have to, but I choose to uh, construct really uh, like a small uh, theaters each time and I change them something like every month. Uh, and when I came in the gallery in Paris, uh, bigger and uh, uh, I like to keep this spirit. And I think it's a good way that uh, people can project themselves with the pieces. And also I think the pieces uh, take lives a little bit differently uh, because they are with other pieces uh, than in a white cube. Uh, where they are a little bit alone and uh, there's, um, I think there is a little bit more poetry when you try to make a, a, a scenography. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing that the, the, the kind of can be intimidating in the context of a fair or a gallery is if you feel like you can't interact with a piece. And I know that Juliana, it's something that, um, Actually, if we could bring the next slide up, uh, it's this wonderful piece by Cecilia Moore, um, Parlour Life. And these pieces are meant to be, they're kind of designed in a way and crafted in a way that they can be played around with and touched and moved. You, you know, I think that's such a nice kind of way of breaking down the boundaries and making a piece feel more interactive. Do you want to just say a bit about, about the thing, about, you know, Cecilia's um, idea behind that? Yes, yeah, so Cecilia is, um, her work is really playful and she does want us to interact. So she's, they're metal pieces and we were, I mean, um, first of all, unbelievable colours achieved through patination. We were blown away. I mean, that blue is just incredible. And I'm holding one now. They just fit, each element fits in the palm of the hand. Um, you can see here. It's amazing. Uh, and so, and they're waxed so that we can actually you can see these beautiful, <laughs> beautiful tactile qualities. And that's what we miss about mm. the physical shows that we can't mm. get someone to feel this because if you, there's something so beautiful about holding this in my palm and she's, you can rearrange these pieces on your mantelpiece and you can change them around. So every day you can have a different view, you can play with them. And I have lots of artists that do that. I have Simon Gager, who's behind me, this metal um, sculpture, the pink one. And you can move around the objects in that one and interact with it. And these elements are just so playful. They've got uh, there's something so joyful about them. And just what she's managed to achieve in metal is just astounding, really. Yeah, it's amazing. And the piece next to the piece behind you, um, next yes. to the metal piece, is that also by Cecilia? No, but so the middle piece is Cecilia Moore, so that's yeah. another interactive piece. So exactly. you can take the parts out and move them around. It's like a bowl, still life bowl. And she's done it like a Mirandi painting. And she's even managed to capture the texture of paint in, in metal. It's incredible. So they've kind of got a mottled effect. So you can create your own still life, really minimal or really full and vibrant. And then next to um, Cecilia's balancing act is Simon Gage's metal piece. And again, these metal parts move around so you can actually create your own sculpture mm. and it's painted pink on steel. So there's a really uplifting, colorful, kind of joyful feel about these sculptures. Lovely. Um, so I think we're kind of running out of, running to the end of our, our talk, but one thing I, we haven't really touched on, but I imagine it's something, well, I know it's something that Joe's doing probably on a daily basis, but, um, Joe, what is to be gained from commissioning a bespoke piece from a craftsperson over buying um, kind of an existing piece? And I imagine for you, it's obviously if it's very specific to a space or the specific dimensions, you, that's probably when that when the bespoke element really comes to the fore. Absolutely. And I, um, I suppose each project has its own moments to, um, to have that. But um, yeah, it is about... Um, the scale or proportion or perhaps there's a you know something that uh, you know uh, a piece that has um, a, a smaller scale where we can blow that up and make it fill a bigger space or we can commission a group of pieces um, that can do the same thing which we have done uh, many times and then I think also um, yeah I suppose if something needs to be fixed 
mm -hmm. as well. So there needs to be a consideration of to how it's going to be attached and and how it's going to function. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's my favourite thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Joe is the woman to go to if because uh, I think that is you know <laughs> I think for um for people without an interior designer as the conduit I think commissioning something must be terrifying because you're taking a gamble on color your own taste um quite what you're going to you know and obviously you're, you're putting all of your faith in a craftsperson which I definitely would but I see you know it's a scary process you're you, you don't is. necessarily know what you're going to you yeah, know and as we've yeah, said absolutely. throughout this talk materials do different things in different you know Every, uh, it's like Laurence and those chairs that we were looking at right at the beginning you know everyone's different and that's the beauty mm. of them but equally it can be the space where you know oh I didn't expect it to turn out like you know it, something might not look as as you'd imagined it um which is the exciting part of it all <laughs> yeah I think it's also really brave to commission something and sometimes it might not work out but taking that leap and you're putting a lot of faith in the artist to make something and I think if you know the artist and you become familiar with their work, then you kind of are assured that you're going to get something pretty amazing. Um, yeah. So, and actually what we've kind of touched on throughout all of this, but it is about relationships and forming relationships with craftspeople and artists and trusting in their vision and their, their skills. Um, so yeah, it's not just about the pieces, it's, it's about something a bit deeper. Um, Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Joe, Juliana and Laurence for um, for this afternoon. And thank you, everybody else for for watching. Um, if you've got any, I think we've had a few questions in, but please feel free to, to put them in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and we'll have a few minutes now to, to answer a few. Hi um, there. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, back in the room. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just typing a couple of uh, responses to people. Um, Lizzie, I actually think you had a couple of really great questions. So do you want to kick off with those? Yeah, of course. Um, Joe, I've got one for you, um, which is, do you have, and I, you've kind of touched on, do you have a favourite material? I'd say it's probably somewhere between tapestry and ceramics, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I might just throw you a curveball and say, I don't know, <laughs> I, I, I suppose, I mean, I do, I do enjoy all materials and, and I think, you know, uh, certain colours in certain materials that just really excite me. And you, we did talk earlier about glass and I was a bit, but actually, you know, a sort of intensely red glass, I just find, you know, really <clears throat> intoxicating, but also kind of, you know, a sort of emerald green silk or a, a peacock blue velvet, those, those things that I just could, you know, fix my eye on for the whole uh, for a very long time um, but I do really enjoy hard materials as well and I think the terrazzo is a really beautiful material concrete is lovely you know all these things have uh, their own intrinsic um, uh, uh, beauty and I think it's it's important to kind of have your palette of colors and textures <coughs> excuse me that <coughs> that you would always be able to kind of refer to but but um yeah I love materials <laughs> um, and then I've got another question, probably aimed at, um, at Juliana and Laurence. Um, but how how would you recommend starting a collection with a limited budget, or, or kind of is the you know where do you begin? <laughs> um, we've got quite a few artists that do two ranges really. So you might have, for example, Akiko Harai who does the big moon jars. She also mm. does a domestic range, so you could buy a cup or a bowl or a, or a bottle from her that is always a slightly more affordable and it's a really good inroad. Um, and there's a lot of more emerging makers that are just leaving college. And sometimes if you keep an eye out, galleries often show a more affordable range too. There's ways to start collecting. So I think find the work that you love and then see what range they make and see if there's something more affordable that you could buy. I totally agree. <laughs> brilliant um okay so there's a few good ones coming here any, any sorry any more that want to come from there no, no uh, it's all good <laughs> i think um there's one here from mark and he said which i think is a really interesting point he says why is glass any more fragile than ceramics mm -hmm. he has been a collector of, of he has 200 pieces and uh, he says barely any of them he'd describe as fragile. What, what has the glass community got to do to kind of change that perception? Because those pieces, 
in uh, Laurence's gallery were just stunning. So I think it's a very good point that people think, oh, we can't have glass. And actually, mm. it, is, it is pretty robust. So Laurence, maybe, maybe you can answer that. Yes, I think it's more an idea than a, the, a real perception. It's a, it's a perception of the, of the glass that is fragile. And uh, maybe also it's because of his, its um, transparency. Uh, the pieces of, of Martin are not totally uh, transparent. And uh, of course, they are quite uh, large also. So, but I think the transparency is, uh, makes, uh, makes us afraid. Um, I'm thinking of um, uh, the, the, the dome pieces, uh, the French uh, brand dome. Uh, who made uh, a lot of things and art pieces, also sculptures in um, in uh, in a crystal, and they aren't so fragile at all. Uh, that's right. That's right. Interesting. That's good. Um, this is quite an interesting one, and it, it's very much talking about the the role of the gallerist. I feel it's. Um, craft is obviously being increasingly more taken up by interior designers and interiors in the home. So how can design, you know, designers and artists get that connection? And for, you know, I think my understanding is that interior designers having that relationship with a gallerist is so super important because they're able to help that process, but also help with the actual artists themselves. You may not either have those connections or feel comfortable or confident. What, you know, just between Joe and maybe Juliana, what's, how important are those relationships? Sorry, excuse. Um, sorry. Yes, go. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, the bang, excuse the banging. It's just going on outside. Well, Joe, uh, Joe, oh, go on then. I was going to say, Joe, do you want to go first and let Juliana <laughs> wait for the knocking? I mean, uh, yes, there is, there's, uh, you know, there are, um, obviously, there's a, a great role that the galleries play and um, in helping to expose us to new artists as well. And I think um, once we've kind of made a connection and um, working alongside both um, artists and gallery can be, um, you know, really fruitful um, process, I think. Um, yeah, and, and certainly Collect has, is great for that. I think there's, you know, just so much variety of craft, um, increasingly so, and um, exposure to new galleries every time um, it's on. So that, that helps us certainly to, um, to kind of be exposed to more artists. Yeah, and so, I think I, I was thinking the role oh, of the, the sorry, the role of the gallery is really important to bring the best work to the client. So we are selecting the best of the kind of artist oeuvre, if you like, and and that's an important stage in artist gallery client. I think it's really important that the gallery is kind of validating and also you know going to the studio, choosing the work that they think is the best of that work and then presenting it to the client so you kind of have that relationship with the gallery and you also have a relationship with the artist another question i think is really interesting is um they're saying thank you very much for an insightful talk this is from jessica um what happens to the value of a crafted piece when the choice of materials differs from possibly the traditional ones for example in ceramics using waste materials in the making of glazes as opposed to raw natural ones and indeed pieces that are made from non-traditional materials maintaining that value um juliano do you want to answer that one uh, you mean maintaining a value it's it's if something's not made in a maybe a precious material or something that's traditionally seen as that traditional material in making how how does that affect the value can it affect the value the way and um, i think it's if you're looking at we're, we're going to have to look at new materials going forward and i think a lot of artists are doing really exciting things with recycling materials yeah. and plastic and stitching and I suppose it's just the value is defined by the artists and where they stand in their career and their provenance and where their work is shown. Is it in a museum? You know, are they having exhibitions in places? So what we, it's difficult to put a value on things, I think. Um, 
I think yeah. the the Sana Gatea pieces, you know, they're paper and it's recycled paper. And I think traditionally that really wouldn't be seen as a valuable material. You know, it's a sort of it's recyc it's being recycled. But I think what all of us have kind of been thinking about with this talk is it's it's interpreting things in a different way. It's like, you know, the, it's like the tapestry is broken down or thread, but it's the fact that it's the different colours it's sort of something to do with the application rather than the material I think yeah yeah and, and, the... and crop yes and using skills from the past to interpret contemporary artworks and we're going right back through different cultures and the way cultures mm. use paper and thread and material and that is what is so great about collect is it brings all these traditional skills and presents things that are so contemporary and kind of mind-blowing and different and that I think is the kind of joy of these, these I do think that the, the value is is in the hand of the maker, isn't it? And it, their meditation on their process and and what they and that is the value. I mm. think it's 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 almost irrelevant what it's made from. Um, I think definitely. Yes, it's a creation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually thinking about materials that might traditionally be regarded as as not as kind of. Um, you know as, as sort of inferior compared to something else I think we're seeing more and more in interiors um an emphasis rightly so an emphasis on sustainability and really and it, it can't just be a trendy thing it has to actually be a really kind of um we have to take it seriously because there is so much waste and there is so much that's you know it's not sustainable to just rip out interiors and keep replacing them and you know so all of that has to be thought through and I guess that's also coming into craft as in you know clay that's been recycled why is that any more, you know, that's what if someone, you know, the process of recycling it and the taking the time to get the consistency right, then make a new piece. That's an incredible use of resources and that should really be championed and, and, and celebrated. Yeah, and, and I also think I, I think the time, I mean, if you think it's quite, craft is actually quite affordable. If you think about some of my artists take six months to make a piece and it's, and yeah. um, you can buy it for under 10,000. I mean, that is, it's in relation to what people pay for art. It's pretty mm. incredible what people pay for something that has taken so long for artists to make. Um, I think it's, I think that's such a good point, Juliana. I think contemporary craft is so accessible and it's, it's a, an area where people want to share it with you. They're very open and, and it's a very warm hearted, um, you know, area of, 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 the, of our sector. Um, and actually going back to what you were saying, um, Lizzie, Elizabeth, it was just like Sanar's piece behind. Ultimately, it, it, it doesn't mean to say that if it's made from a waste material, that the quality of making isn't there, that kind of intellectual thinking around creating the piece is still there. And that's actually where I would say the value is, as you say, it's made from old magazines, but my gosh, it's a stunning, stunning piece. I wish you were here with it, but it's just gorgeous. Um, we are slightly running out of time. I'm going to just ask one quick one, which is from Deborah, Deborah Finn, which is uh, Juliana's uh, business partner. Juliana, um, sorry, this is for Laurence. Um, she's really interested in the Reno Clessons, the, the, the pieces, those amazing pieces that we saw positioned in the sand and are just, we can see them just behind you there. Um, can they be, they're absolutely stunning, she's saying, can they be used, you know, is this kind of inside outside or there is that where? Yes, exactly. Work? Exactly. As it's uh, ceramics, it can go outside, of course. That's fantastic. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, any other questions you want to ask each other? <laughs> I was going to ask, are they solid, those ceramic stores? Are they solid? Uh, yes. yes. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So heavy. Solid. Quite wow. heavy. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you all. This has been absolutely, you know, the comments that have been coming through going, this is really insightful. They've learned so much. Everyone going, I really, really want to know who, who that was you just spoke about. There will be a, um, a, a little PDF that we'll create from this and the talk will be recorded and we'll put that up as soon as we have it ready for you. Um, but thank you all so much. This has been really, really, really interesting. And um, yeah, lovely one to finish on. And thank you so much, Lizzie, for um, hosting it and for the other three of you for joining. So thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.